kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to an introspective version of the Star Wars In Review podcast. It's the only podcast led by two Star Wars frat boy Chicago Fire fans. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who used to avoid Mormon missionaries by telling them he was Jewish. And over here in Maya Madrid, who was once a Mormon. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer a few of your insert generic mailbag name questions here, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, how are you? I'm good. good. And that worked. And I would I would still tell missionaries that... If they came, because then they just immediately leave you alone, and you don't have to have an uncomfortable conversation with them. I think it was something about the the there were a bunch of Jewish people when they realized the baptisms for the dead sued the Latter Day Saints Church, and so there's been an acrimonious relationship between um, Jewish people and the Mormons because the Jewish people sued them. So hey, I'll, it I'll, worked. All I know is when I was walking around campus and they started it in, and I said I'm Jewish, they just immediately went, "Oh, thanks," and walked away. So <laughs> everyone saved time, and everyone won. Well, that's good news. Good, uh, like I guess it's. I don't know if that wasn't a great segue. It's a good story, I guess. I, I guess so. I have good news. Oh, okay. And this whole uh, kidney stone thing. There's still a kidney stone in me. Okay. Um, but I've been doing a better job of getting healthy. Part of the reason you get kidney stones is dehydration, right? Sure. And so I have been cutting out my Donald Trump level soda addiction. Nice. And I have not had a soda in 29 hours. And the week before I had only had one a day and now I'm mixing it with coffee. I'm getting a little healthier, lost 10 pounds just by soda. So that's uh, awesome. Things are, uh, things are looking good. I still, uh, there's bad news though. I still have a kidney stone in my in my in my cherry area. That's true, but maybe it'll be the only kidney stone in that I, area. I sure hope forever. so. Forever. I sure hope so. What's going on with you, man? Oh man, this is one of the most exciting times of the year for me, sports wise. The MLS is going. The Fire actually won a game. Hey. Uh, NHL playoffs started. Uh, my Wild didn't look so good in their first game. Well, they looked okay, uh, but it's going to be a hard series. Hopefully, a long series. So I'm enjoying that. The the Bucks. Got probably the best position they could have hoped for, the best yeah. matchup they could have yeah. hoped for, in going against the Celtics, who are really injured, and the Timberwolves ended a 14-year yeah. drought, which, you know, if they would have lost that game in overtime, would have been, they would have tied them for the, the longest playoff drought in NBA history. They so, were they were thank, in the third seed for a while this goodness. year, and that would have been, you know, I'm, I'm really happy for the Timberwolves. Timberwolves are a team that I liked, unfortunately, ever since they drafted Christian Leitner, which is a topic for another podcast, but... Uh, you know, it would have been a really sort of horrif- horrifying way to go out if they had lost that game and, and fell out of the playoffs after how well they'd done throughout the season. Well, and I'm not a big NBA guy. I, I watched the uh, the wild game ended, so I flipped over to the Timberwolves. So I watched the last quarter, and I couldn't tell you the last time I watched a full quarter of the, of NBA basketball on TV. But it was it was exciting. But I have I have friends who I mean that's that's their team. Yeah. You know that they have suffered with and. And all those for years and years. And I sit there and think back to, you know, 14 years. I mean, if you're, you grew up a Timberwolves fan and, you know, you're 20 years old, they were, you were six the right. last time they were in the playoffs. You that probably year, don't even remember it. That was the year with Garnett when they went to the Western Conference Finals against the Lakers, right? Yeah. Yep. And Cassell got hurt. Otherwise, I think they could have had a good shot in the, yeah. the semifinals to make, uh, to make the finals. And everyone thought that was the start of something big. And then they never went back. Yeah. So it happens way too way too much of the time. Well, uh, let's get to so the news. Let's just oh, say, sorry. George Trueheart, you're not listening, but congratulations, buddy. You earned it. Oh, man, I haven't thought about George Trueheart in a long time. It's okay. He's got a he's got a ring for also working for the Lynx. So. George is awesome. I love you, George. If you're out there, I love you. Let's get to the news for real this time. Okay. There's a bumper here. Yeah. Okay. There's, we're, we're bumping. Moment. Go now. Now we go. Now we go. Go. This has been an awful start to the episode. Hey, we can start over. Hey, this week saw the second trailer release for Solo, a Star Wars story. In it, we get to see more of Donald Glover's Lando, Chewbacca, and more of Alden Ehrenreich as the titular character. From what I've seen, the response has been pretty positive. While some have said they're still having trouble seeing Ehrenreich as Solo, most have seemed to say that the trailer was very good. And even some... Popular YouTube voices have said that the trailer has changed their mind about the movie and they are starting to get excited. Now, Luke, you've been particularly rough on this movie, mocking with your usual offhanded arrogance. Did you condescend yourself momentarily to take the trailer in? And if so, what did you think? 
I I watched the trailer and uh, I we emailed back and forth or text or whatever after it and I talked about how I wasn't overly excited about it. I don't remember what my exact phrasing was, but I I, th- I thought about it a lot since then and I can, I think I can pinpoint it because I don't think a lot of my problems with this movie are what people traditionally are complaining about. The Lord and Miller thing doesn't bother me that they got tossed. Rogue One had lots of changes, and I love that one. Ron Howard doesn't excite me, but he's competent. Like, I'm not worried about him putting out something that's total garbage. My main reservations about this movie are that it's going to be kind of cliched, formulaic, fill-in-the-blank characters just kind of stuck in the Star Wars world. Um, Woody Harrelson even kind of alluded to that with his everyone's going to betray you line that that he had in there. But even Ironreich, he has lines that I don't think came off well, and he has lines that I think came off very well, but I don't put a lot of stock in that because taking one line out of context, it's impossible to know whether that's good or bad. And I saw him in Hail Caesar, and I liked him in that. So he's one for one for me. So I'm I'm not too worried about that. One thing I want to say about Alton Ehrenreich, let's not forget that they they – interviewed 2,000 or so actors for Star Wars, like, or for this role as Han Solo in this movie. Um, so that gives me confidence that he's going to be a, a solid actor, this idea that he's a bad actor. I think it was a bad situation with what Lord and Miller wanted and with what he was giving at the time. I don't necessarily think he was just bad, like a lot of people just assumed. The, well, the speculation was is that Lord and Miller wanted tons of comedic improv- Im- improvising. Right. And he's not someone who does that. So it's the wrong situation for him, and that is why he was struggling. Now, who knows if that's true? That's just the rumors we read on the internet. We certainly don't know anyone right. involved. But I know if, of them. I know who they are, their names. Exactly, but that would make sense then, that if things are not working, that you bring in a director like Ron Howard, who is going to be able to work in a, a more in a situation that uh, Ian Reich's probably more comfortable in. So I'm not worried about him. We'll see how he does. It's fine. Um, I I like that he doesn't seem to be just doing a Harrison Ford impersonation, yeah. which I think is important. Um, I think you want to look. I'll, I'll take the Star Trek movies as an example because there are there's one performance I really like and one performance I really hate in those movies. I really really like Chris Pine. I think he does an amazing job of of making that character his own, but still kind of sticking to what you've seen previously with it. And I hate Carl Urban really as Bones in that because I think he's doing a Saturday Night Live sketch impersonation of DeForest Kelly. And it, it turns me off. So I'm glad that Ian Reich's not just trying to do a Harrison Ford impersonation. What I've really figured out about this movie, what's really happening here for me, is there's been no anticipation and no build-up to this movie. I think it's too close for me to The Last Jedi. I'm used to having lots of long build-up between Star Wars movies, where I'm just dying to get images of what's coming out. I can't wait for that first teaser trailer. I mean, when Force Awakens first released that trailer, and it was about six images, right? It's Finn sticking his head up, the the three-sided lightsaber, and BB-8, basically, and some stormtroopers. And No, the Falcon Falcon wasn't even in that first teaser. Well, maybe the Falcon was was in the first teaser. But I probably watched that thing on YouTube 200 times. Couldn't get enough of it. And and, And even the prequels... You, you had to wait three years in between prequel movies, which I think made us like them more at the time than we do in hindsight because we were just so starved for it. That having this movie come so closely, Han Solo, on the trails of on the tales of Last Jedi, I've just had no time to build up any anticipation or whatever. I'm still, you know, and I really liked Last Jedi, so I'm still someone still feeling that wave of excitement from that movie that I just haven't had time to dedicate to this. I mean, the visuals in the trailer look good. I don't think there's anything in this trailer that would throw up major warning signs. I, I already mentioned my couple minor complaints, but I really think it's an anticipation thing for me, and it worries me about what I'm going to think when we start getting three or four of these a year. Well, I, I think one of the good things, at least for where we are now in the Star Wars universe, is that you're going to get a year and a half before Episode Nine. And so you're going to have that extra time to get excited for that movie. And I think that's why they stuck so hard to this release date, even though when everything would have probably told them to move it to December. Because they're going to give that full time to kind of, not full time, but I mean more time to sort of sit. So you had mentioned that um, you were happy to see Aaron Rank 
uh, taking more of like the Chris Pine version. And I thought that too. It's actually in my notes where it's it's like Heath Ledger or Christian Bale when Christian Bale did Batman or Tom Holland when they did Spider Man, where it's not it's not Harrison Ford. And and I'm relieved to see that. And he's he's kind of making it's it's not Harrison Ford, but it is Han Solo, and it's a new sort of look on High Solo. Han Solo. I don't think either of us want a facsimile of Harrison Ford in any attempt to do so. I, I never thought of Bones that way, but I think you're exactly right. The 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 more I think about it, the part that it, Bones doesn't really bother me in the Star Trek movies because he's not really a focus. It's more of like kind of like a shout out, and he's he's kind of a character that just hops in. So I guess it never really never really hit me. So what would you say to people who are uh, you know, this is not their Han Solo. They're still worried about Han Solo. If, if you're, if, if seeing another interpretation of Han Solo is too much for you to take, then, then don't go. You yeah. don't, you don't have to go. But if I, I don't, don't go just to hate it, <laughs> go there and give him a shot. And if he's bad because he's bad, then that's fine. And that's your opinion. And you know, everyone gets moved by art in different ways, but let him have his shot to do his thing and figure out if that works for you. Because if you go in saying he has to be exactly like Harrison Ford, it's not going to happen and you're not going to be happy. No matter what he does, he's not going to be able to pull that off and he's not going to be able to recreate the memories you have from the first time you saw Harrison Ford do that. No one can do that but Harrison Ford for you. So if you're if you're going to see it, just go in and, and give him a chance and be excited that you're getting a character you really like. And I think this is something that we've seen in other franchises. One of the ones I think principally of is the matrix, okay. right? Which the first matrix I think is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, one of the, the best science fiction movies ever made. One of the best action movies ever made. The second two are garbage. So I'm very easily able to say, well, I just don't watch them again. I don't need to worry about their continuity and the things they say. I'll just watch the first one because I like the first one. So if that happens to you with these movies, then then fine. Then you can cut Solo out and pretend it never happened and your life will be fine. And you don't have to go on the internet and scream at strangers about it. <laughs> right. Well, we kind of hope you do. Unless it's us. Because then we get attention. Tenure. Yeah, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about Donald Glover. I think in some ways Donald Glover's Lando is similar to Aaron Reich's Han Solo, where I was expecting more of a caricature of Billy D. Williams, and you don't get that. He is Lando without being Billy D. Williams, and he is suave. He brings his own suaveness to it. What I like is the tension between Han and Lando in this trailer, which is the exact same tension I felt that you get in Empire Strikes Back when they f meet each other again for the first time. So you feel like that anticipation. And that line, when he just makes contact with with uh, Han and he's just holding his glass out for with the droid and he's just like, everything you've heard about me is the truth. Like, it just was such a great line. And to me, that is Lando. It's a different Lando, but it's completely Lando. What are your thoughts on... Oh, it's, I'm a huge fan of his. That's been the mo thing I've been most excited for since they announced he was doing it. He, he looks great. He sounds great. He he was bringing his own style to it, but I even noticed some of his hand motions and things he did were things you could tell that he saw from watching Billy D. Williams. Very similar to how Ewan McGregor would kind of twirl his mustache and do things the way that Alec Guinness did, but without trying to just impersonate Alec Guinness. So I'm, I'm very excited for that. He's sitting right next to our good buddy Scissor Punch, which yep. is pretty exciting. <laughs> so uh, hopefully they're best friends. But no, I, it, it was good. And I think you're right because they have a friendship where they're friends, but they don't trust each other. And I think that came across in the trailer in just a few short scenes. So I'm excited to see what, what he brings to this movie because he is going to be probably by far the highlight for me. I love, you know, we've seen two, at least like a three bar scenes in star wars right there was the or there was the uh the original one in the cantina and then the prequels there was the one on coruscant and then um there was the one in mas Kanata's place but what i love about this particular bar cannabite scene, oh cannabite yeah i guess i, I thought of that as a casino and not so much as a bar oh. but you're right you're right so this would be the i think of them as all as uh, right. cantina callbacks yeah sure but, but the reason why I'm, I'm kind of excited to see this one is it's so damn cramped yeah, everything is just it? like very like like just everything is just oppressively close and in this meeting where you know we don't know exactly how han is going to get possession of the falcon or even if he's going to get possession of the falcon necessarily in this movie and it's just like you, you felt the tension so much when he's talking about his ship and empire strikes back and even like on on when they're when they're getting ready to go to endor in return of the jedi it's still like an awkward conversation and it's just like 
it's uncomfortable and yeah. that's and that's why i love how they've chosen to, to make this sort of real claustrophobic aren't you excited too to see how the falcon the center of the falcon apparently has to break apart in yeah some way? and it the, get the dirty and nasty and, and and i think i've heard i don't know if this is if this is a fact but i've heard that if this goes well the people are uh, the actors are signed for three movies and so i wonder if we'll even find out yeah, I don't know. I think that's standard procedure because um, even Felicity Jones was signed to a three-picture mm-hmm. deal, even though her character was initially supposed to live, which is probably yeah. why. But I think that's just standard operating procedure for Disney now is hold on to these guys for cheap when you first sign them and get right. as many movies because all of a sudden you're paying Robert Downey Jr. $80 million for you know 20 minutes of Spider-Man. Right. I, I want to move on to the person that I... or the character that I think they got the absolute best in this, and I think... The way that they showed Chewbacca got me in the feels so much. There are people out there saying this is going to be Chewbacca's movie. And if there's, like, if we like how Alden Ehrenreich stands, he stands like Harrison Ford, and we like how Lando's sort of motions are about, like, Billy D. Williams and Lando, and we're, we're feeling that, like, Chewbacca's spot on, dude. Chewbacca is perfect. To me, he's the star of the trailer. He's been so wasted in the first two uh, episodes of these these new movies in episode seven and episode eight and it seems to me so far that he could end up being the best part of this film there's a delicate balance between han as the boss and as a friend and it seems like when you watch the old movies they take turns from being sort of the one like the 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 one who's the voice of reason and the one who's being an idiot right and so in like the first movie like han's like we better get out of here and take our money and go because we like money (laughs) and then it's chewy who convinces them to go back and and save luke whereas in return of the jedi chewbacca is like can't handle his hunger and like goes after like yeah you know like the dead animal and gets a little more impulsive it seems like there's a lot of tit for tat in their relationship and that's why i kind of like it like when you first think about it chewbacca is is a pet you know i mean that's how he was created he was literally created by a visual of George Lucas seeing a a very large and or very large dog in a car, and so I love how it like he's not a pet. It's the interchange, and they're both really flawed. And you get the idea that together they're both flying by the seat of their pants. Like maybe Chewie has it a little bit more together, but the idea that we may see Mala in this, and there's just that short clip where he's like grabbing the other Wookie and like sort of doing like the headbutt, and that that freaking got me, man. That got me bad. And we know from the extended universe, um, from the aftermath series, like Chewbacca's son is part of canon. So I am. Well, is really the holiday special not canon? I Did they eliminate be. that? I don't know. I don't think they want to talk about it. <laughs> To me, getting Chewbacca right, and they added him. There's there's a scene when Han is like looking at the Falcon. They added Chewbacca to that scene, and there's a scene where they're. Do you think they the added scene. him, or do you think he was removed from the first trailer? That's a really good question. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think he was probably removed from the first trailer to make it a more Han focused shot. Mm-hmm. That would be my guess, but that's complete speculation. Either way, I mean, I just love the fact that Chewbacca's there, and they're always walking. You know, like side by side and there's that line where you know like what do you think and Chewbacca kind of shakes his head and he's like yeah what do you know anyways yeah it's just it's just so well done I really think Chewbacca you know I'm just super excited for that like Chewbacca may make this movie for me yeah yeah no I I think he's good I gotta say I I haven't paid as much attention to Chewbacca probably because I was so focused on um Lando and Han in it but I did like his uh his body slam yeah. move that he does to someone and i think if i'm assuming what we're seeing there is going to be him getting freed from slavery uh on kessel or, or whatnot and i think that could be something really fascinating that we haven't gotten a visualization of just you know mention of and i think it's in some novels and and whatnot but to to see it on the big screen could be really fun i think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be fun about this uh where we're gonna things that are touched on very briefly or thrown away mentions you know like the kessel run in Star Wars, we're going to actually get to see them now for the first time. So it, it, I think there's a lot of potential for this movie. Again, um, m- my biggest concerns is that they, they're putting these movies too close together, so I'm just not having the time to get excited about them. And um, I'm, I'm a little nervous about Amelia Clark and Woody Harrelson and the whole the whole team dynamic and then him Woody Harrelson betraying them and that they, they, they're kind of telegraphing a little too obviously. So I, maybe I'm wrong or maybe they'll just pull it off in a fun way where you don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, I, I think this isn't something anyone should be panicking about. True. Well, whenever I feel the need to panic, I always think about Kathleen Kennedy saying that Lawrence Kasdan's script for this movie was the best Star Wars script that they've ever seen. Yes. And she didn't have to say that. But just, just to be a downer to you, no, don't, J.J. No, Abrams no. said that The Last Jedi was the script he wished he could have wrote yeah. because it was so good. He, he, 
talk to. I, yeah. Yeah. And so do you. I do. So we have uh, we have a bit of an issue. We're changing the name of the mailbag segment because of the evil empire screen junkies uh, stole our idea before we had it. Bastards. Uh, I can't decide what I want the name to be, so I've decided to put a vote out on Twitter. Four options: jammed communications, which is the one. Oh, Star Warsy. Yep. Uh, and spaceballs. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. We'll just pretend like I did. Okay. Uh, Ask Luke, which is very creative and very original. Maya's mailbag, which is uses the alliteration, it's or my creative. wife's favorite emails that kids seriously got. And right now, that is winning the Twitter. That feels uh, like our style. Feel like our style. So, uh, Jed in Florida writes, "What do you guys think about a spinoff movie based on space battles and dog fighting?" Oh, I would love that. I s- s- space fighting would be, I, and that's kind of what I thought we were going to get with Rogue One. Even though it, I had no complaints, it ended up being more of a ground story. But my favorite part of Rogue One is the the space battle. It's the best battle of any type they have in Star Wars, in my opinion. So I would be all about that. Uh, there's obviously a lot you can take inspiration from. I mean, that was a heavy influence on Lucas when he made, you know, World War II films and things like that were a heavy influence on the original Trench Run. I mean, Lucas even revisited it with Red Tails when he made that movie. So I think there's a ton of potential you could go with that. I would love to see just kind of a balls-to-the-wall action movie. Like you were saying earlier, like, you don't have to throw much plot into that. You know, just just go out there and have fun and make a visual spectacular that's 90 minutes long, but is just thrilling and stunning. I think that would be a real crowd-pleaser. And I think that would be the good type of movie to have in between these long saga movies that are more character-focused, is to have something that's kind of lighter and, and just action heavy and kids would love it i it makes a ton of sense to me uh my only my only thought is if if you're gonna do it don't don't bother trying to tie it into some larger or you know some other part of like i don't want to see uh you know that in um the last jedi that there were some space battles going on on the other side of the dreadnought or something like that and you're Mm -hmm. giving and you're just trying to fit into that space create your own space you have millions of years worth of fighting in this universe to to work with and the clone wars went on for forever uh the the original rebels battle with the empire went on for forever so don't try to shoehorn it into something that's already existing make it its its own thing and just go wild yeah i agree uh two of my favorite things about the extended universe have been rogue squadron and black squadron and so rogue squadron they 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 basically took wedge antilles and made him a lead character and just wrote tons of books about it. And it was basically start, or, uh, Top Gun in space. And I think if they were going to tie it to something, like giving Poe Dameron a spinoff movie and focusing on Black Squadron would be cool. I agree with you. I would rather them focus on something completely new. I would love... It would be like my personal dream to have a movie devoted to the Royal Starfleet of Naboo and those oh. M1 fighters. Like, that is my... The yellow would, ones? Oh, my gosh. Those are that cool. Would be, that would be so amazing. That's never going to happen. But if it did, I would just love it. It's such... Uh, the, there's such rich storylines for the, for Rogue Squadron and Black Squadron now in the comics. If Kathleen Kennedy calls you up and says, "Luke, we want to do Top Gun in space," how are you going to do it? Well, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna put more volleyball in it okay. than you would have had right. in the original Top Gun. Um, I I'm kind of <laughs> gonna I'm gonna piggyback off of what you kind of said there, and I haven't read any of these comics or books, but do a, a wedge story, but before the Battle of Yavin. So it's maybe him as his first, you know, first encounters with the Empire and having to fight him and what his squadron was like. No, I don't think of Wedge as a maverick type character, but he doesn't have to be. Um, so, so take him and put him, you know, pre-Luke Joinen and and see what they were doing in some of their battles early on. I mean, that that could be some really some really fun stuff. Um, you know, we know that the battle on um, Scarif is kind of their first major win. But there had to have been lots of tinier battles if they're assembling this fleet over time. So let, let's see some of those, some of those smaller missions. And, you know, he's got a squadron of four or five other X-Wings that he's flying with. Um, I think you could have a lot of fun there. Very good. Well, hey, you at home, or if you're on the road, or if you're in the car, or at the bar, or in a shoe. Or we a prefer boot. if you email while driving. Right. Uh, what are you up to right now? 
If you want to help out the show, just send us an email at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com and ask us a question so that we can read it on the show. And if you're listening via YouTube, why don't you give that subscribe button a smash? Help us to make it like Spinal Tap to take us to 11. <laughs> Let's move on to the Clone Wars. Episode 11 of the first chapter, Dooku Captured. The winding path to peace is always a worthy one, regardless of how many turns it takes. This episode was directed by Jesse Yeo and written by Julie Siege. And we hop right into the action as Anakin and Obi-Wan are trying to capture Dooku. The Sith Lord escapes, however, and all three of them get involved in a battle of intrigue and subterfuge as a group of pirates muddy the waters between the Republic and the Separatists. Luke, take us away. So we jump into this one, and it feels like we already missed an episode. Oh my god. So as we start, uh, the Republic has found Dooku... But Anakin has gone missing, and we open up with Obi-Wan jetpacking onto a prison freighter of the Separatists that he believes was Anakin's last known location. He sneaks aboard, and my first thought was, holy shit, we need someone to fight outside in space in these jetpacks, because that looks awesome. So that better be coming in some of these episodes. Uh, But we see that, and then he lands, he goes into this prison ship, escapes some droids, finds Anakin's cell, and we find out that this was a purposeful plan. Hey, man, in the first five minutes, how many times did you check to make sure that you hadn't skipped an episode? I, I turned it off and went back into the menu. Right. Because I, I felt like I had like, skipped one. This is 11? This is number 11, right? Yeah. yeah I, uh, I was totally lost for the first five minutes. And, and I realized it's kind of like Star Wars when they begin a new episode. Where you get the crawl, and you get that guy talking at the beginning in like the 1940s radio voice. Yep. Um, and maybe they feel like they have to do that to fit this stuff in a 30-minute movie, or a 30-minute episode. But holy crap, I was just jarred. There's no yeah. way to describe it. Well, you know, it's it's been a little more subtle in the other ones. They'll introduce a storyline, so they'll give you the lead-up of what happened in the storyline. And it may be a recap of the previous episode if it's a two-parter, or it's just a, hey, these were what these people are doing, so now you get it. But this was more than just, these people are over here fighting. This was like we missed a whole episode. Yeah. Um, but th- but that's fine. And uh, so Obi-Wan, or uh, Anakin got captured on purpose without his lightsaber, so it would look convincing. He not... runs in the family, doesn't it? Like, that's what his, his son did. I suppose. Uh, in, on Tatooine with Jabba. And it, it, it works apparently, but I don't know if Obi-Wan can just jetpack onto the ship while the two of them just didn't jetpack onto the ship and avoid the whole capture thing. Uh, but they they escape, escape, I'm doing quote marks, and then they go find Dooku, who, for whatever reason, didn't kill Anakin, even though he had him captured. He just left him there, even though they kill all the other Jedi they find. And they go to apprehend Dooku, who has a tunnel in his floor, so he hits a button and he he slides down his floor like Every Inspector Gadget. Trait. Right. Yeah. Anakin jumps after him, Obi-Wan obviously takes the more civilized routes, where they meet up in the hangar bay, a little bit of a fight breaks out. For some reason, the droids don't want to shoot Obi-Wan. They just let him run onto a ship. But Dooku escapes in a ship, and Anakin and Obi-Wan, who for the rest of the episode, I can basically just call Obi-Kin to stop screwing their names up, because everything they do is going to be in tandem basically now. They pursue him in a, a ship they stole. Both ships end up getting injured and crash landing on a planet down below that is basically uninhabited so they land on this planet uh obi kin go to look for dooku they find a ship they realize that he must be around somewhere they think he could be in this cave so they go into the cave and he is he is in there he is in there waiting for them where he basically drops rocks on them steals anakin's lightsaber and then drops more rocks on the entrance to the cave and then wanders off to go find help. He ends up running into a group of pirates that are hanging out on the surface and are very, very welcoming and immediately offer to help him and and give him a ride uh, to wherever he needs to go because the planet they're on isn't safe. This is a a good moment for the franchise because it is an introduction to Hondo, 
who is going to be reoccurring throughout the series for a while and has some good story arcs. He is voiced by Jim Cummings, who is a very, very famous voice actor. You'll know him from a ton of things. He took over Winnie the Pooh for Sterling Holloway. But the problem for me with Hondo as a character and with Jim Cummings is that he is using the exact same voice that he uses for the pasta chef in Curious George, which my children loved when they were little. So that's all I hear when he talks is the pasta chef in Curious George. I've never seen that. Thank heavens. That would have that would have pushed the uh, episode down a few bases for me. I also had to go research because I was convinced that it was also the voice of Monterey Jack from Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, but it wasn't. Monterey Jack was actually done by Peter Cullen, better known as Optimus Prime. Oh, okay. So well, there's there you your go. trivia note for the day. Dooku agrees to go on their ship so they can take him to another planet and arrange a way for him to get wherever he is going. Obi can come back to life in their cave. Turns out they weren't killed in the rocks, really? so that's a spoiler alert. Yep. Yeah, they are trapped in here, and uh, Obi Wan has his lightsaber, but it's kind of busted, and Anakin lost his, so they exchange witty banter about that. And Gundark's attack. Which were mentioned once in Revenge of the Sith, and we have never seen them before, so this is our it, first look at them. First in, in uh, Empire Strikes Back was the first time that we heard about Gundark, so that was when uh, Han comes in after Luke gets out of the back to tank, and he's like, hey, you look strong enough to rip the ears off a of Gundark. That's right. Oh, yeah. th- there you go. So I didn't even remember that. So there, it's mentioned twice, but it's our first time seeing them visually. And they fight that thing and kill it, but we're led to believe there are tons more of these, and that's basically all that inhabit this planet and come out at night. So they have to work on a way to get out of there. You cut back to Dooku, who lands on the pirate planet. They have somehow managed to steal his lightsabers, both uh, Anakin's and his, without him knowing. And he's about to try and murder them all when he realizes he's way too outnumbered. So they take him hostage and are going to ransom him. But they very smartly realize that they can't ransom him back to the Separatists, because once they do that, he'll just kill them all. So they call the Republic in order to ransom him to the Republic for the most amount of money. Meanwhile, back on our other planet, Obi Kin and uh, Anne are trying to get out of this cave. They move some rocks and some poisonous gas comes out, and they are both about to die when Ahsoka comes to their hey, rescue. Thanks, Ahsoka. With the JSX Machina. With the clone troopers and opens the wall up in a blast that should have killed both of them, but it doesn't. And they're able to escape and go back to their ship. And when they're on their ship, they learn that. The pirates, Hondo in particular, has made contact with Yoda and Mace Windu and Padme, and they have agreed uh, that they will buy Dooku, but that Obi-Wan and and Anakin need to go see that he's really there, because they don't trust that it's him just from a hologram. So they then set off to that planet to go meet him. And they go down there, they meet with Hondo, and he allows them to go see Dooku, They have a conversation with Dooku where Dooku tells them they shouldn't trust the pirates. That could be foreshadowing. It could not be. Um, And then they leave and report to the Republic that he is really there. The Republic, being the most well-functioned, smartest government it could possibly be, realizes how the entire war hinges on capturing Dooku. And you can only entrust this to the most important people there are. So instead of sending all your clone troops and Jedis, they send Jar Jar Binks with all the ransom. So I can't wait to see how that plays out. They then, back on on the planet, they invite uh, uh, Obi-Kin to come to a banquet where they're going to celebrate. So they go there and uh, they talk about how they need to learn humility. Yada, yada, yada. And uh, be appreciative that they have this gift. They are given some drinks that are mickeyed, but they use their force powers to switch them with two other guys. And as those two guys pass out, they clank drinks and we fade to credits. It's kind of a weird ending on that. I It was a very weird ending and it was an episode that went really quick for me in viewing. So I still thought I had like 10 minutes left when mm-hmm. it, it cut out. We talked about the opening sequence, how they do a narration that kind of catches you up. This episode felt like a narration. Yeah. There isn't really much that actually happened in this, but they couldn't start an episode out saying that Dooku's been captured and not show us. It feels like the next episode is where the story is actually going to happen. The stuff in the the caves with Obi Kin is complete time wasting to round yes. the episode out. There is no point to yes. it. Uh, the same with 
Anakin being pr- imprisoned on the ship had... Well, and he lost his lightsaber. It's the same old shticks that we always see. Like, yeah. Anakin loses his lightsaber. Obi-Wan rips on him for it. They're in, so in over their heads because the rocks fall on their faces. And then the gas happens just like it does in The Phantom Menace. And then Ahsoka, you know, it's just, it's just more of the same. There's no arc of this storyline in this episode. Nobody changes. It's just stuff that we've already seen before. Um, the cave collapse and the gun dart, it doesn't, it doesn't show us anything about the characters. It's just an obstacle to overcome, to waste time. As you said, I did enjoy about this episode. The pirate hangout, Mm -hmm. um, is a little sparsely, you know, we, we talked when we we talked about the Han Solo trailer about how dense it was. This is like the biggest bar ever. And it's got like four people, Yeah, you know, it's, um, I just thought that was weird, but. Well, and that's been something that we've noticed, I think in all the worlds of this show. Yeah is none of, other than Coruscant, which we've gotten very little of, all the world seems to have maybe 50 people that inhabit all of them. very Wyoming. Yeah, like, yeah, like, you know, there's a city, but it doesn't seem like there's very many people, and it seems like that city will be isolated from everything. Which, I don't know, in my head, maybe that makes sense. There's so many planets, they're not all going to be jam-packed, but at some point we need, you would think you would see something with a little bit more mass of people. Right, and maybe it's just easier for them to do it that way because of costs and yeah animation wise it's uh the the not the marvel avengers but the avengers tv show the british spies which was famous for having no one on any of the streets and ever and you know everyone thought oh what a great atmosphere and it's so unique well it was like no they couldn't afford extras and that was when they could shoot was when the streets were abandoned so it just became a byproduct of it so that might be what we're seeing here but it would be nice to have a little variance One thing I want to talk about, you know, Dooku doesn't kill Anakin. And the easy answer, and probably the correct answer, is, well, they didn't kill him because obviously he needs to make it through, and so that's just a plot hole. Do you think that perhaps because of Sidious's weird love affair with Anakin, do you think Dooku may be under strict orders not to harm him? It's or is possible. that me just the Star Wars and me just trying to make excuses? It is possible, but I if they did if that is the reason, it would be fascinating to see more of that because you would think Dooku would have to be highly suspicious of that. The Sith operation, as far as we know, is a, a twofer. They don't operate in groups of three or more. They even which, say that, which is weird because how does the Ventress? How does Ventress? Sorry, I guess her name is not. How does Asajj Ventress fit into this? And I, the Inquisitors, right? Uh, they're not full. Sith whatever's I think is kind of the the escape clause in that that they use to get over. I mean it's one word of dialogue from Yoda and Phantom Menace that kind of locks that in place. But I also think it'd be interesting because you would have to think if that was the case if he's saying, "Hey, there's this one Jedi. You got to leave him be or not kill him, etc." Dooku has to start putting two and two together, especially if he won't tell them that. And in Revenge of the Sith when Dooku is between both lightsabers from Anakin and Palpatine gives the order to execute him, the pure look of shock on Christopher Lee's face is really well done and to me makes me think he has absolutely no clue that the Emperor would allow him to be killed Mm -hmm. and replaced with someone else. Like, he really thinks he's the guy. So, if if you're going to use that route, I think we need more to justify it. And right now, it just makes you think, well, we couldn't kill him, and we needed an additional three minutes in this episode, so we'll do this weird, he's a prisoner for some reason, even though we don't need him to be a prisoner. Yeah, it was weird. It was a weird episode. It is a weird episode. It doesn't feel like an episode. It's It was hard for me to even think in the rankings, because I didn't hate watching it. Right. But nothing happened. You know, it just felt like a, a giant setup. You talked about the the party in the bar at the end, and one of the things that I really liked about that is I like seeing some of these cultures that are removed from the war. Because everything we see is the war, the war, the war, and every planet we see is massively affected by the war. So I think it's interesting to see a culture and a people who the war really doesn't mean anything to. They're not affected by it. They're still doing their thing. They're completely fine. Um, I, I like that aspect of Tatooine. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Um, I don't like the sequence in Cannabite. I'm not defending it, but I think the concept of a society that doesn't care about the First Order 
and all that is interesting. So I was fun fun to see that in this episode, and I hope we see a little bit more of that because I think it's it can be fascinating. And I know we're going to see a lot more of Hondo, so I'm hoping we see a lot more of that worked in. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that the, whenever you get that third sort of independent group that's working in the spaces in between, it takes you back to when we first saw that in Tatooine and we first saw all these people in the cantina um, who were, were kind of somewhere gray. And, and we actually learned about them really before we got to learn a lot about the empire and a lot about the, especially about the rebellion. Uh, how many pews do you give this? Oh man, this is a hard, I'm going to have to, I have to give it two pews out of five, uh, for, for Laura Dern to shoot at it because again, I didn't have a bad time watching it. It just doesn't feel like an episode. I mean, it just, it felt, it felt like the first part of a movie or something like that. That was setting it up so hopefully that's what it'll be we've seen in these two-story arcs that the first episode is usually hugely disappointing and the second episode is amazing but it's gonna be a jar jar episode so i'm not sure i'm ready to commit to that the one last thing before i turn it back to you for ratings that i just could not forgive myself if i didn't mention because it's probably my favorite part of the whole episode is that hondo was in a rotating flying saucer yeah, from like a 1950s yeah. sci-fi movie that shoots it's down sh- and oh yeah, my god, ship is just like a UFO. I, I it, loved that. I yeah. thought that was really cool. Like, I'm it glad gives they you the idea that, that it's been Hondo who's been visiting our planet. You know? Yeah, and it's like pirate raids. I know exactly. Cool. Hondo, right up your butt. So, <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't think we I didn't think we had to go there. That's where I always go. I don't know. We'll leave that to me. So where where do you put this one? Where well, was how tough. you rank it? It was tough because I did not have a bad time. And, and I thought that Jesse, yeah, had improved so much from the first time. Uh, the first episode that they directed was Bomb Bad Jedi, which is my least favorite episode in this entire series. By so word, by far. So uh, this was such a step up. And really what it comes down to is it's going to be in the middle. Do I like it more than those rising malevolence Shadow of malevolence, the you know, <laughs> oh, that, the history of the everything yeah, of the malevolence. There's there's yeah. so much malevolence, and I was so irritated by the uh, so ready to be done with malevolence. Yeah, that uh, this is just like right above it. So it's right in the middle. It's literally out of the eleven. It takes the sixth spot, and it's okay. it's fine, but mm-hmm. it's it, nothing happens. You know what I think they should have done, which I don't get why they didn't. Is you have this pursuit of Dooku in the preamble that they just talk about and don't do, why didn't you make that the first part of the episode and have everyone get to the pirates at the end of the episode and cut out all that cave nonsense? Mm -hmm. It probably would have made for a more coherent story and been a little bit more interesting. I don't know. This is the same director who directed Bomb Bad Jedi. So what are you going to do? Yeah, there's nowhere to go but up, so good for you. I was was getting really excited because everybody talks about season one and how it gets better as this as the season goes on and so we got to 11 and i'm like okay we're starting to hit our stride uh there's going to be you know all these great episodes that are so well planned out and it was really kind of a step back so it was you know it's in the middle but i was disappointed that's fair let's talk about other nerd news i'm a nerd we have news for the beautiful people there's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what's going on with the nerdy things in your life? Well, my, my life is hard right now because I mentioned how it's a fabulous time of year sports-wise for me, but it's an insane amount of good TV that is hitting the air right now or about to hit the air. Atlanta's back, and I'm already behind on that. Uh, Legion came back, which is one of the most me shows I think possible because it's weird and it's crazy and you've never seen anything like it, but it deals with the X-Men mythology that i grew up on and i can't tell you what's happening probably half the time but i don't care no spoilers but there's a three-way dance off i i'm just what (laughs) and it makes total sense i i just i i'm in love with that show the handmaid's tale is about to come back westworld is about to come back this is a great time for me but what i started watching that i'll mention today is a new hbo show called barry It is two episodes in. It is Bill Hader, who I am a big fan of from SNL and every Judd Apatow movie. But he writes it and directs a lot of the episodes. And the the plot line is that he is a a veteran who has been an assassin. And he is sent to, to L.A. to murder someone and decides while he's out there he wants to become an actor. And that plot line, when I first heard that plot line, I kind of went, oh, it sounds like an Adam Sandler Netflix movie. 
type thing. But <laughs> it is so well written. The performances are great, and it is surprisingly sweet and good hearted that you would just not get. It is a really reserved performance from Bill Hader, which I haven't seen before and I really enjoy. It's only two episodes. It's also got Henry Winkler and Steven Root um, and uh, the computer program from The Good Place, if you watch that show. So there's some fun people in this. The guy who plays Caliban in X-Men Apocalypse is a major guy in it. So that's Barry. It's on HBO having a really good time with it. Excellent. Well, for me, I've been... I, I, this is not going to shock you. You have hung out with me or, you know, when I used to live out east, I would fly back here and we'd watch a movie and within four minutes I'd be asleep. And True. So, and True. so I, it takes me a lot, a really long time to read books because I read them right before I go to bed and like fall asleep two pages in. But I've been reading A.C. Crispin's Han Solo trilogy and I'm in the first book of that. It's um, kind of gearing me up to be excited for the movie. Um, it's the first book of the series. Han is 19 years old. He has just kind of like escaped um, this guy named uh, Gareth Shrike and that whole thing. And he ends up on this planet where they're, they're basically like a, a, like a religious cult. And oh. it's really just like a, like, a, like a misdirection to get these people to like uh, basically be slaves to like uh, manufacture spice, to manufacture drugs. Well, that would so, never happen in real life. Right. So he's... Uh, <laughs> He's he's you know basically flying for these people and he gets you get to see Han kind of like the same old Han from the movies and so I enjoy it. that part as you might you might uh, not be surprised. Sounds like a good ramp up for the movie as yeah. well, which maybe that's the reason you picked it. And I'm glad you brought Han back up because the thing I forgot to mention in the trailer was I adored him saying I have a really good feeling about yeah. this. I thought that was a really nice touch. I think, I, I agree. That was one of my favorite lines. The, the line I like more than that is really when he was like, you're 190 years old? You look great. See, and that I, was more, that was more of like, I think that's more Aaron Reich's Han Solo than Harrison Ford's Han Solo. And I'm okay with that. Like, yeah. That, that's actually the line where I went, oh, I'm not so sure about this. Really? But yeah, but again, I, I want to see it in the full context of everything because I think, to pull out a single line from a single scene that you haven't seen and go, oh, he's bad. Mm -hmm. That line wasn't delivered, right? Well, you don't know, and you don't even know if that's the edit of that. You don't even know if that's the take that'll be in the movie, because mm -hmm. we've seen that hundreds of times where it's a different take in the trailer. So, But I'm I'm not worried about his performance. I think he will he will be fine, and the movie will be enjoyable, even if it's not fantastic. Speaking of enjoyable, it's now time for us to part. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Star Roars in Review podcast. Mr. Neitzel, where can the people out there contact you if they would wish to touch base with you? I am on Twitter sometimes, not all the time, but some of the time at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. For me, I'm at Maya Madrid. Please don't forget to send us an email. Uh, we don't know what the email segment's going to be called, but we do know that we'd like to read your emails. Thank you for, so much for joining us, and until next time, we've been Kids Seriously, and we are out. Bye. <laughs>